Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is Hanukkah is not the Jewish Christmas. I repeat, Hanukkah is not the Jewish Christmas. What Hanukkah is, quite frankly, is the most misunderstood Jewish holiday in all of Judaism. There are two parts of the Hanukkah story. The first part is the is found in Jewish sources, especially the Talmud, in the Tractate of Shabbat. It's the story of a single crucible of oil that lasted eight days instead of just one. It is a very short Talmudic discussion, but it is there. It's recorded history in Jewish sources. The second part of the Hanukkah story is the tale of Judah Maccabee, the famous hero who, together with his family, led the battle against the oppressive Syrian Greeks called the Seleucids and won. As a tale, it's a great story, but basically, the story of Judah Maccabee is complicated and problematic. In fact, the rabbis edited out the story from Jewish history. It's not found in any Jewish sources. Almost everything we know about the story comes from the Book of Apocrypha of Maccabees 1 and 2, which was probably written centuries after the Battle of Judah Maccabee and the Seleucid Syrian Greeks. Apocrypha means hidden or secret books. These books were not put into the Hebrew Bible. They are not considered rabbinic works. They are considered elder books. Sifrei chitzonim, they're called. The story of Judah and the Maccabees is clothed in controversy. There is no doubt that the rabbis knew about the battle against the Seleucid Syrian Greeks. There is a reason explaining why the story of this battle and these heroes was let out. It was left out of the rabbinic history totally. And there is a reason explaining why it is so central and so important and popular today. The rabbis shunned this battle story because more than the battle between Jews and the Seleucids, it was a battle between Jews and Jews. It was a civil war pitting Jew against Jew. It was a battle between the Hasmoneans, those Jews who rallied behind Judah Maccabee, and the assimilationists, Jews who followed Hellenized Greek customs and fell under the spell of the culture of the Seleucid Empire. The Book of Maccabees refers to the conflict as a battle between Hasidim, the righteous, and Mityavnim, those who tried to be like Greeks, the Jewish Hellenists. Had the story had a happy ending, the rabbis might have embraced the tale, but that was not to be. You see, a few generations after their victory against the assimilationists, the Hasmoneans chose to combine the priesthood and kingship. They shunned Jewish law and tradition. They became corrupt and oppressive. And as a result of their poor decisions, Herod rose to power. Herod, he was the last of the Hasmonean kings. The rabbis could not embrace that tradition and that history. And so, the story of the revolt did not make its way into the canon of the biblical or rabbinic literature. So why is Judah Maccabee and his family's story such a central part of the story of Hanukkah for us today? Here's why. When early Zionists were searching for models of Jewish fighters, they found the story of Judah and the Maccabee, and they elevated these long-ago warriors into the culture of Judaism. These Zionist leaders were not concerned with the essence of the story as the rabbis had been. They needed heroes who fought with weapons and defended Jewish society and Jewish values. And the Maccabees fit the bill. These same Zionist leaders, by the way, scoured history and found another story not to be found in rabbinic sources. They found the story of Masada, which comes to us via Josephus, the Roman historian. Those warriors atop Masada were Jewish fighters. But because they chose mass suicide over capture, the rabbis would never, could never promote them as heroes. The mystique crafted by those Zionist thinkers did not just transform history, it shaped the image of Israel and Israelis and Jews across the world. The Jewish hero, a defender, a fighter against great odds, became the model of the modern state of Israel. And that legacy lives on to this day. That is why Hanukkah is such an important holiday today. Not because it coincides with Christmas and we have something to celebrate like everyone else has something to celebrate, but because, like the state of Israel today, the Jewish state, Hanukkah embraces the model that Jews were the masters of their destiny. It's not a very rabbinic idea, but it is certainly a very Zionist one. I've also been thinking about Iran, especially about a nuclear Iran and about nuclear weapons. 
On November 29th, the nuke talks resumed in Vienna. The talks were suspended in June, so that presumably Iran could coordinate a presidential election. A new president, Ibrahim Raisi, assumed his post in August. Finally, six months later, the six months after they stopped, the talks resumed. Did Iran really need time off to coordinate an election whose results were decided in advance of the actual ballots being cast in the first place? No, of course not. The real reason the talks were canceled and were called off is because Iran wanted them called off. And the real reason they were rescheduled is because Iran agreed and actually de uh, deigned to once again sit down and talk. Iran has the world over the proverbial barrel. The Islamic Republic of Iran, once known as Persia, directed both the tone and the substance of the talks. When the talks first began, they were between Iran and the group of, which was called the P5 plus one. P5 plus one stands for the five permanent members of the United States Security Council plus Germany. When the talks resumed, they were between Iran and P4 plus one. Why the change? What happened? Well, P4 and not P5, why? The answer is that the United States was not in the room. They were nearby, but not, not there. The United States finally monitored and officially monitored the meeting. What this really means is that the US zoomed in, able to communicate with their P4 partners and even with the Iranians if they wanted to. There is very little chance of long-term success and not because the United States removed its presence from the room. Simply put, the talks that the world was so anxious to see resume is viewed so dramatically differently by the parties that there is little chance of finding common ground in the long run. For the P5 plus one, the meeting in Vienna was about nuclear negotiations. They wanted to bring Iran back into the realm of the famous or infamous nuke deal, which is officially known as the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. The permanent members of the Security Council were united in wanting Iran to conform to their previous commitments in the nuke deal. In truth, they were Pollyannish in believing that that could happen at all. Actually, Iran's chief negotiator, Ali Bagheri Khani, made that point perfectly clear. He said that there would be no nuclear negotiation taking place at all. He said that the nuclear issue would not even be a topic for discussion. He said that the talks were, and I'm quoting here, lifting the illegal and inhumane sanctions against Iran, unquote. Before the talks resumed, Iran's new president, Ibrahim Raisi, backed him up. On the running state television, Raisi explained that, and here's a quote again, the negotiations we are considering are result-oriented ones. We will not leave the negotiation table, but we will not retreat from the interests of our nation in any way. Iran seeks the lifting of all U.S. sanctions and neutralization of sanctions. Iran's message was very clear. As always, they know what they want and they know how they will get it. And now we know it too. In essence, the world has been warned. As if offering an olive branch, Iran promised to once again permit the IAEA, which is the International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors, back into their nuclear facilities. It's a small lure. They've offered that to show the P5 plus one that they're willing to make sacrifices. But is it really? These inspections are part of the original deal. Nuclear facility inspectors are part of a set of agreements that far predate the JCPOA. It's not a compromise at all. And it's not a surprise that Iran breached these agreements in the past and dangled the same lure in front of the P5 plus one. International inspections of Iran's nukes have never been freely available. You see, Iran though, has no intention of turning back the clock, and that's what they would have to do. Now, right now, Iran is enriching uranium to 60%. That is way over the 3.67% levels agreed upon in the JCPOA. It's also way above the three times, the three times above the small amount, 20%, which was permitted for scientific and medical research in just one facility, by the way. Science and technology cannot be unlearned. The genie cannot be put back into the bottle. Once Iran learned how to enrich to a certain level, the ceiling was raised. Iran is so proud of the advance they've made, despite being prohibited from making those advances. A spokesperson for the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran actually announced that, quote, so far we have produced 25 kilo, 60% uranium, which except for countries with nuclear weapons, no other country is able to produce, unquote. What's really happening is that Iran promised 
to allow inspections in exchange for what they really want, the lifting of all sanctions, not just nuclear sanctions. P5 plus 1 might actually accept these preposterous offers, but only maybe in a modified form. The year of stiff sanctions did not bring Iran to collapse. Western world has not achieved its goal of limiting Iran's race to achieve a nuclear capability. So as opposed to tightening sanctions against Iran, why not just go ahead and ease them? That's the idea, it seems like. Iran is racing towards nuclear weapons, and right now the P5 plus 1 might be acting as Iran's facilitator. Coming up next, points of view. First up is a column by Brian Bloom, and it was published in the Jerusalem Post November 18th, 2021. It's entitled, Jews are not white, race and identity in Israel and the U.S. Opinion, subtitled, if Israeli Jews are white, then we are the people of color that these white Jews must be oppressing through their white supremacy, the Palestinians, of course. Bloom writes about an important issue that many of us have, have raised and will continue to raise. Jews are not white. This is how he begins. When I was growing up in the United States in the 1970s, I would often need to fill out some official form that asked for race or ethnicity. I always marked the box for white and sometimes Caucasian. I didn't think much of it at the time. My Jewish identity wasn't yet particularly developed. Of course, I was white. What else could I be? That's come back to bite me, and Jews everywhere, big time. To be white these days is a kind of slander, writes Jerusalem Post's Seth Franzman. Jews have been transformed into whites, which Franzman correctly notes, is at its core anti-Jewish. Bloom continues to quote Franzman, explaining just how unusual it is to call Jews white. Bloom writes, Muslims in Albania are not called white Muslims. He points out, nor are there any white Hindus, white Buddhists, or white Catholics. Only Jews are called white Jews. Franzman stresses, which forces them into a white category in America, the category that means majority and privileged. As a result, in some American circles, identifying as Jewish has become synonymous with white supremacy, he says. Now Bloom gives even more examples of the craziness, he continues. That amalgamation is obscene, writes former Jerusalem Post editor and current New York Times columnist Brett Stevens, because lumps Jewish Americans with the sort of people who march in Charlottesville in 2017, chanting Jews will not replace us, unquote. But Bloom explains some people disagree. As an example of this, he writes, tell that to Rebecca Vilkomerson, executive director of Jewish Voice for Peace. We white Jews especially need to recognize that centering on our status as victims here is a power move, as well as a way to avoid self-reflection on our relative status in a white supremacist world. Bill Cumberson tweeted that last year. Bloom concludes with the advice that we should judge people on their own merits. He put it this way, every country, every conflict, and every individual should be judged on its own merits. This destructive binary applies an unfair and inappropriate American lens on Israel and the conflict. That won't help us come to any kind of an equitable resolution. It will only lead the players to have the most stake in the, to dig their heels in further. Getting there will require nuance, empathy, intellectual rigor. Sadly, I'm sure that's something Americans know how to do anymore. Bloom makes an essential point. The weakness of this column, though, is that Bloom quotes way too many people, and we do not see enough of his own logic and analysis. Next up is a column from New York Jewish Week. It's written by the editor, Andrew Silo Carroll. The Jewish Week is online only now. It's a very different media outlet from what it was just a few years ago when it was a print publication also. The column is entitled, Is Anyone Jewish Enough to Play Golda Meir? Silo Carroll explains and asks important questions about whether Jews and only Jewish actors should be cast as Jews. The comedian Sarah Silverman was the first to ask this question. He begins, a still of Helen Marin playing Golda Meir in an upcoming biopic recently made rounds in the social media. Someone reacted on Twitter. This is what happens when non-Jews are cast as Jews. What happens? 
For what I can tell, the makeup artist did a credible, respectful job of turning the glamorous Marin into a frumpy mayor. And knowing how Marin has embodied other historical figures, thoroughly unlike her and Golda, Queen Elizabeth, Heather Hooper, Maria Altman, I'm sure her Golda will be just fine. Marin's casting as mayor, however, is the latest hook for a debate over whether Jews should play non-Jew on stage and screen, grafting arguments about representation and inclusion onto the Jewish narrative. Comedian Sarah Silverman touched off the latest round in what some call the Jew face debate in a September episode of her podcast, hearing that Catherine Hahn was cast to play Joan Rivers in a limited series. Silverman complained about the number of Jewish roles that have gone to non-Jews, saying Jews don't count in the push for representation in Hollywood. Salo Caro goes through the list of reasons why one might object to non-Jews playing Jews. He concludes by writing that personally, he does not care as long as the actor delivers. He writes, but let's face it, the only thing actors can ever promise is the illusion of authenticity and I'm happy to watch a non-Jew play a Jew, or any actor play any role, if they deliver. But I am wary of saying that actors shouldn't play Jews if they aren't Jewish themselves, because that's a short step away from saying that actors shouldn't play Jews if they aren't Jewish enough. I must say that I disagree and find the entire discussion deeply troubling. Does no one look at this discussion and not ask the big question? If Jewish actors must play Jews, what about Jews playing non-Jews? Can't and shouldn't and why wouldn't non-Jews come and say, why and how can a Jew play the role of a non-Jew? Of course they would say and do that. The entire argument is absurd. It opens up a true and troubling Pandora's box. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. I want to show you six cartoons today. The first is a cartoon. It's, it makes fun of the COVID variants and how one after the other, they keep coming. A man and woman are looking at an ad at a bus stop. The ad reads, Corona 5, Attack of Omicron. And the picture is the virus eating up Earth. The man says, oh man, I hate sequels. That's funny. Next up is a meme of a set of jelly donuts being filled with jelly. The caption reads, almost finished vaccinating my donuts. The only side effects depends on how many you eat. <laughs> the next meme makes fun of how Austria shut down the country recently because of COVID. The police are dragging away Maria, actually Julie Andrews, from the famous wonderful movie, The Sound of Music. The caption reads, the hills are now closed. Now a tweet from Liron Kapinski. This is simply a funny observation. He writes, May Hashem grant me the inner confidence of an Israeli restaurant owner who translates his menu into English without actually running it past anyone who actually speaks English. Everyone who has visited Israel knows what he's talking about. These menu mistakes are truly cringeworthy. The next is a meme of John Kennedy. Uh, Republican senator from Louisiana. Kennedy can be hilariously funny. He always has a folksy expression to prove his point. This one is perfect. Kennedy is saying, I don't know why we have to give money to countries who hate us. They should be able to hate us for free. <laughs> Finally, for those who do not realize that Facebook and all the social media is watching us and tapping into our lives, just look at the way the word Facebook is written in this picture. The two O's of Facebook are watching the man as he sits typing away at his computer. This cartoon is called Facebook is Watching. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. Weeks ago, one of Israel's largest hospitals was hit by a cyber attack. It took over a month for the hospital to get back to normal operations. And that actually means operations. Hadera's Hillel Yaffa Medical Center finally returned to full operations after a ransomware attack that crippled the majority of the hospital's systems. The cyber attack that all but paralyzed the hospital was orchestrated by Black Shadow. It's a hacker group out of Iran. 
The cyber terrorists attacked the hospital with ransomware. They demanded money. The hospital refused to meet their demands and pay. It took over a month, but they finally fixed the system. The interim uh, period, they used an alternative web system and relied on the good old fashioned low tech pen and paper to keep records. Patient care did not suffer. Israel has become a giant in cyber technology. All of us know that. They're cutting edge in so many different ways. We hear a lot about cybersecurity, of course, but cybersecurity is not the same as cyber technology. It's just one part of it. Cybertech is everything related to the internet and cyberspace. Cybersecurity is one part, as I said, albeit an important part of cybertech. How large is Israeli cybersecurity technology? How big is the giant? Well, 40% of the world's investment in cybertech is invested in Israel. That 40% is invested in Israel by private equity companies, investors, and even governments. As a result, inventions, innovations, and cutting edge developments are coming out of Israel. All eyes are on Israeli companies and on Israeli military. Why the military? Because that's where they groom the tech leaders of the future. A huge government investment in the computer industry and in cyber army helps Israel retain its cutting edge positions. The military has fostered cyber tech talent in the hope that it will both protect Israel and allow for the development of weapons capable of striking the enemies of Israel by way of cyber attacks. Now, Israel will continue to be on the cutting edge. There's no question. The Jewish state will continue to innovate. They have the human capital. Israelis. Israel's energy minister, Karine El Harar, recommended canceling the proposed oil deal between Israel and the UAE. El Harar's office issued an official statement that was broadcast actually on Israeli radio, Galei Tzahal. It read, I am calling to cancel the EAPC agreement. It poses many risks to the Gulf of Eilat, to residents, and it does not benefit Israel's energy market. The proposal was to have the UAE tankers filled with oil arrive in the Red Sea port of Eilat and offload the oil. Israel would build a pipeline from Eilat to a Mediterranean port and then upload the oil to tankers and ship that oil to Europe. The plan never really considered either environmental costs or environmental dangers. Israel's energy minister is not alone in her concerns. Even the Israeli Supreme Court demanded an explanation for this venture and a plan that would protect the environment. This is to be continued. Events in the Middle East are changing quickly. Long-held assumptions are no longer givens. The foundations are shifting. For instance, Iran's deputy foreign minister, Ali Bagheri Khani, a name you should know, who also doubles as the chief Iranian nuclear negotiator, visited the UAE. And in Dubai, he met with several UAE leaders. UAE presidential advisor Anwar Gargash reported that the meetings went well. In a tweet, on the eve of Iran's nuclear negotiations in Vienna, with the P5 plus one, Khani announced his visit to the UAE. After the meeting, he tweeted that we agree to open a new chapter and that the meetings were friendly and cordial. These two countries have been on opposite sides regarding Syria, Yemen, and of course, Israel. Iran is not the only country sending emissaries to the UAE. High-level visitors have included U.S. Special Envoy to Iran, Rob Mali, and representatives from Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain. They all went to the UAE to discuss the seventh round of nuclear talks in Vienna. There is much to be learned from travel itineraries of world leaders. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, let's say, for instance, recently met with Russian President Vladimir Putin. The meeting took place in the resort town of Sochi. The discussion centered on diplomatic and regional issues, most importantly on Iran's role in supporting radical groups like Hamas and Hezbollah. Israeli Defense Minister Gans traveled to Morocco for a two-day trip, jump-starting relations between the countries. Morocco is jumping on the peace train with Israel, a.k.a the Abraham Accords. The Prince of Abu Dhabi, Crown Prince Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the UAE's de facto ruler, traveled to Turkey. He was there to mend very fraught diplomatic relationship, brought on by Turkey's courting of Russia and Iran. By keeping track of who goes where and when, and when they go where they go, we are better able to predict, plan for, and plot future world events. I spent a lot of time doing that. 
Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gans delivered the speech, during which he publicly announced that Iran had attempted to smuggle explosives into the West Bank for Hamas's use. The Iranians were flying in all these bomb-making materials by using a Shaded 141 drone. The drone took off from T-4 Air Base in Syria and was filled with TNT. The drone was shot down by Israel near Beit Shan, not far from the West Bank. All this happened in 2018. It was only now made public. Gans chose to discuss this drone and TNT as a way of illustrating how Iran is expanding its influence. Iran wants to control the entire region. Iran wants to support any and all potential minions and proxies in the region. Israel is working hard not to let this happen. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. I have come to a serious conclusion about Jew hatred. I call it Jew hatred. I try not to use the term anti-Semitism anymore. Um, There's a lot of reasons for it, and I'm going to try to explain it. Jew hatred includes the Jews of Israel. When you use the term Jew hatred, there is no way for the hater to squirm out and justify their ugly ideology. That's why I use the term Jew hatred. My conclusion is that there is no way to convince Jew haters that they are wrong. If a person hates Jews, there is no chance that you can convince them that they are wrong. Their hatred is often the tool used to justify their actions against Israel because of a perceived injustice they feel is being perpetrated on the Palestinians by Jews. So rather than waging an unwinnable battle, I suggest that Jews focus on doing good and pursuing justice, that Jews focus on their own agenda and do the right thing. Jews should not worry about how they are perceived by Jew haters. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. Mm -hmm.